Logarithms Netmon Freemium delivers real-time network visibility to quickly identify emerging threats in your IT environment. Netmon Freemium is a free commercial-grade network forensics and traffic analytics solution. You can use Netmon Freemium's powerful capabilities to search against all observed network traffic, identify abnormal traffic patterns and application usage, and quickly analyze full packet captures. Take the first step towards real-time network visibility. Visit logarithm.com forward slash freemium to learn more and download it today. The SANS Institute, the most trusted source for computer security certification training and research. Visit SANS.org to explore their full curriculum and latest training offerings. NetSparker, the developers of desktop and cloud-based web application security scanners that enable you to automatically identify vulnerabilities in your web applications and web services. NetSparker scanners employ a unique and dead accurate vulnerability scanning engine that automatically verifies vulnerabilities with their proof of concept. For more information, visit them on the web at netsparker.com or email at contact at netsparker.com. Welcome back, everyone, to Security Weekly. Really quick, itpro.tv forward slash security weekly. Use the code SW30 and try it free for seven days and get 30% off your monthly membership for the lifetime of your active subscription. I love itpro.tv for their supervisor portal, which means your organization can buy a subscription for ITPro TV for any number of employees in your organization, which means the project managers can get project training, your active directory folks can get active directory training, your security folks can get security training. And you can monitor your employees' progress. You can allot, what my recommendation is, allot time for your employees to actually do the training from IT Pro TV in conjunction with sending them to conferences because, you know, they have to do that at least once, I think at least once or twice a year, go to a conference and uh, experience and, and get hands-on training. But in between those times, subscribe to ITPro.tv. Full transcripts are available. You can go right to a specific module and right to a specific uh, topic inside of that module uh, to get some insights into that particular technology. Fantastic things happening at ITPro.tv. Those uh, Stealth Bits webcast is coming up on, that's our next webcast, uh, Thursday, November 9th, Doug White, Jonathan Sander, and myself, we're going to talk about forensics. It's kind of interesting. I've tasked Doug White in saying, what's it look like to do a forensics investigation, and analyze the file system manually, and what information do you get? And then Stealth Bits is going to talk about how they're automating some of those processes to allow you to do some of those automated forensics and figure out what is in your environment, what's happening on the file system uh, somewhat in real time. So that's going to be a fun one. I'm tapping into Doug White's resources as a forensic investigator and our fine friend Jonathan Sander at Stealth Bits, who's just, I mean, if, if you only tune into the webcast just to hear those two guys speak, it has nothing to do with me. It's all about Doug and Jonathan in that webcast. Tune in just to hear both of those guys uh, talk on this webcast because it's going to be awesome. Securityweekly.com forward slash Stealth Bits. Our special guest for tonight. And Tim's been on the show before. Tim came to my house at like two o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> it was like, "Hey, I'm here for Security Week." I'm like, "Dude, like the show doesn't start till six. Like, it's it's fine. You can you can hang out for a while. I I, I get. I'm like, you want a drink or something? He, he, he's a he's a prepper. <laughs> he is, he's, <laughs> he's a prepper, and he stayed for the whole time on that show and uh, talks about it fondly. And I'm I'm just glad it, he feels bad. Tim, you feel bad like you showed up at my house early that day. Like, dude, it's totally fine. It's totally fine. We love hanging oh, and, out with you. But it ruins, it, it ruins the story if, if you say it's okay. Because it's true. I mean, the pre previous producer was like, "Hey, you should you should come over at like three thirty. I'm like, "I'm pretty sure on the East Coast that the show starts a little bit later than that." So I show up, and your poor wife answers the door, and I think you had she had just had a baby, so she looks like she hadn't <laughs> slept. She's holding this baby, and a <laughs> random dude shows up at the door, and your wife is so uh, nice. So she's like, "Yeah, come on in." Paul will be home in like five minutes. So I don't think you were even home yet. And I'm like, I, should I was probably like, I'll get later. diapers like, no, 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 or okay. formula. Just stay. And then, yeah. Oh God. I sat there for like two hours. I didn't, I had never met these guys before. It was, oh, it was fantastic. And then we hung up for Stogie geeks. I had you did, you the stayed. best cigar of my life and I have no idea what it was. <laughs> uh, well, Tim, tell us a little bit about your back other than crashing my house first. We have a studio now. Fast forward <laughs> several years later. There's, there's, you know, it's not at my house anymore, uh, which is awesome, which is fun. We have a whole studio, but uh, tell us about what you, you work Gee, for. Was that 
Where was that time that I crashed your house? Was that about the same time? You're like, you know, maybe we should move out because people just randomly crash our house and stay yeah, pretty here for much. hours. That and was hours. that was kind of the deciding factor. I'm like, random security people come to my house. We should probably. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not impact the family life with people crashing the house. That was actually the not because of you, Tim, but because we wanted right, to right, right, sure. allow people to 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 hang out without impacting. You know, my wife and I having babies. We have three now. Uh, we're done, thankfully. <laughs> three is the limit. Um, <clears throat> but Tim, describe uh, uh, to me uh, some of your career path. Um, I don't know where in your career you were when you first uh, came on the show and crashed my house, but. Uh, you worked for counter hack <laughs> challenges for a while. Like, t- tell me about, tell our listeners more uh, appropriately about your uh, kind of career path. Sure, sure. I started off my my undergraduate was electrical engineering, so my background is actually in control systems. I uh, did that for a few years. Got into uh, to networking. Uh, was a huge fan of that. In fact, I, I still I still love networking. The problem is. I hate troubleshooting latency, which seems like 100% of the issues with networking. And then, of course, nothing ever breaks at 2 in the afternoon. It's always 4 in the morning, right? Um, So from there, uh, and I worked at a university, which is kind of fun because you've got your own adversarial network full of really smart people right inside your own network, right? Um, So went from there into a financial services organization in in Minnesota, uh, didn't really, they didn't really have a security person, so I kind of became that guy, kind of wedged myself into the process, um, started doing pen testing there, did consulting at Fishnet, uh, moved That's to That's right. Uh, you were at Fishnet when you came on the show, I think. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. And then I was at CounterHack and uh, recently started my own company uh, a little over a few months ago, and that's going well so far. And then I also teach with Sam's. So, by the way, if you want to come join a class, come to uh, – was in New Orleans in January, teaching 660, the advanced pen testing course. But now, somewhere in there, um, in Active Directory security history, we talked about patch the hash um, in all these attacks against authentication, NTLM, NTLM v2, and largely we had some solutions. And not everyone's implemented all those solutions, but like, yeah, we have solutions. Like, it's called Kerberos, and Kerberos is pretty sound. And then you developed this talk and this concept of how to break Kerberos tickets inside of an Active Directory environment. And I think everyone thought you were kind of full of shit in the beginning, to be quite honest with you, Tim. <laughs> Until you showed it to certain people and were like, wow, like Tim's really not full of shit. Like, this is a real thing. And you're kind of like... No, no, we still thought he was full of shit. We just no, we still him. thought he was full of shit. We just, he had to prove it to us. <laughs> Different reason. Right? Like with crypto, Richard, right? Like when people right. say, I can break right. crypto, you're like, no, you're full of shit. It's like interesting shit. It's different. <laughs> yeah. He's full and, of interesting shit. Exactly. <laughs> but lo and behold, so many times in the show, since you've been on, Tim, we've referenced you as like, oh, no, no, Tim's like the, the, the dude who broke like Kerberos for, for Active Directory. Uh, and you've since gone on to extend that even further. So give us some of the insights into the the kind of history behind your looking at Kerberos tickets and the ways to break them within an Active Directory environment. Sure. So I started looking at it kind of about the same time uh, Benjamin Delpy started breaking into some of that stuff. And I had this talk, the talk that I delivered at DerbyCon, I think it was 2014. I shopped that around for 18 months and I yeah. couldn't get anybody to take it. So did you, did you, did you, no, so you submitted it to DerbyCon and you weren't accepted the first time around. Is that true? I think, I can't remember if I did it to DerbyCon the first time, but I did DEF CON twice. I did mm-hmm. ShmooCon. I did a whole bunch of them and I couldn't get anybody to pick up the, the thing. The talk, which is like, oh man, what, what that, what the hell's going on? I, 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 I ultimately, I think I'm going to blame myself. I think I was trying to be too brief in my talk description mm-hmm. because if I'm somebody who's reading a talk description, I don't want to read much. But I don't know what the deal was. But anyways, finally, Dave uh, invited me to DerbyCon a few years ago, and I delivered the talk. And it took a little while for the word to get around, but so far, you know, it's kind of fun stuff. People seem to be using it, so that makes me and, super and happy. And what was the title of your your first talk uh, at DerbyCon? It was, uh, I actually got over here, it was uh, kicking the attacking Kerberos, kicking the guard dog of Hades, because mm-hmm. Kerberos in mythology is the three-headed dog that guards the gates of hell, which, you know, active directory, gates of hell, lots of parallels there, right? Yeah. Well, in, in parallels to authentication, uh, some interesting background. When I was at the university, uh, we used Kerberos for authentication, and we had 
an internally developed application that did basically single sign-on using Kerberos as the back end, but was implemented in Perl in the front end. And I always, like, my shit detector would just go off. So when I saw your talk, I kind of it kind of brought me back to there are ways to break Kerberos because I think a lot of people when we talk about well, Kerberos ticketing and authentication is a very proven me- proven method. There's no way to break that, but obviously you're one of the people that have shattered that perception. Yeah. So one of the the big thing there on the Linux side, if you get into Kerberos, the uh, the they need a shared secret between the uh, the KDC, the Key Distribution Center, mm-hmm. and the uh, the, all the clients and the servers and such. Um, and on the Linux side, they actually pick good, or I don't know, I hate to say good, good random stuff, talking to a uh, gentleman <laughs> here about randomness. Better, let's just say, okay? Um, so better random keys versus um, like a password. So the, uh, the, the issue ultimately boils down to the Kerberos keys are encrypted with the only shared secret in Active Directory domain, which is your password. So you can use that to ultimately end up getting the uh, cracking the passwords for. I love that it comes down to, that are, to entropy you know, and, and, and encryption in the, in the end of the day. And it comes down to the name of your dog at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's yeah. right. Well, well, that, but, but it's it's more than it's more than that though. You know, Tim's saying that this is an implementation choice yep. uh, gone awry, right? I mean, that's the way I interpret it. What do you think, Tim? No, I mean it's it's the fundamental. There's only the one shared secret in the in the Windows environment. Um, now you can tie the key back to the, the computer account, or you can use good service accounts with the I forget the exact name off the top of my head, where but where it actually generates good passwords and rotates them. But we haven't always had that that ability, and these service accounts are long lasting, and people are like, oh well, nobody can touch these accounts, or no one's going to get the password hashes for it, so we can have the same crappy password forever. And by by God, do not take down the SQL Server cluster, so no one ever wants to touch this stuff, right? So these so accounts Tim, linger I, and linger and linger. So take me back. So when I was learning about Windows security, it was a very loose model based on NTLM or LM, God forbid. And then when we when Microsoft introduced Active Directory, I remember we had that Kerberos authentication system that was based on Linux, and that that was cryptographically sound, and everyone felt it was secure. And then Microsoft adopted Kerberos in Active Directory, and I was kind of skeptical because I'm like, they are the ones that came up with the LM, but they adopted Kerberos <laughs> as part of their authentication mechanism. Give some people some fundamental knowledge to understand how authentication works uh, before we get into how to break it. Sure. So the fundamentals, there's a, there's a nice graphic. I can send the link to you guys for the show notes. Um, but there's a nice graphic on how the authentication works. So the first part is you're going to authenticate to basically the domain controller, and you're going to get a ticket that's going to let you request a di- additional ticket. So if you that's think your of like ticket a- granting ticket. Right, the TGT. So think yes. of that like the, the yeah, nice. <laughs> I remember. So think back. of that like the um, amusement park. So that's the ticket that lets you inside the amusement park. Gotcha. Now, if you if you want to go on any of your rides, you have to get tickets for each individual ride. So you're going to use your ticket granting ticket to say, "Hey, can I go on this ride?" You'll get a uh, response back from the server, and then you'll you'll pass that ticket essentially to the to the ride to the server, and then the server will look at that and it, it will decide, because the domain controller. It, it can't store all of the rights. It's just too busy to do all of that. You'll pass the ticket to the, the service, and the service will say, oh, yep, you're allowed to go or you're not allowed to go. That's awesome. And then that ticket that you send to it, so you, when you request a ticket for a specific server, you actually get two pieces back. There's one for you and one for the, for the server. Think of like the tickets where you uh, tear one in half, you yeah. give half to the other to somebody else and you hold on to one. Well, the half you keep, you can decrypt. The other half you're going to hand to the server, and that's encrypted with the uh, the hash of the, uh, the service account. And again, if that service account is a poorly chosen password, we can now crack that. And the beautiful thing is, any user can request these tickets. So any lowly user can request any tickets in the entire domain. They don't actually have to even touch the remote service. In fact, the service can be offline totally and completely, um, removed from service, inaccessible, powered off, whatever. As long as it's still linked in Active Directory with the SPN, we can uh, extract that ticket and then crack it offline. So you could literally walk into an environment, pop the first box, and request thousands of tickets and start cracking. And what's the SPN, Tim? That's the uh, service principal name. That's a mapping between the uh, the 
basically the, the remote service and then the account. So mm -hmm. let's say you've got a, a web server called Web Zero, Web Web O One, and it's got you know it's running HTTP. There's a mapping between that service, so um, HTTP on Web O One to the underlying account. Gotcha. Hey Tim, so, can I ask a yeah. question? Sure. Um, do, sure. Do the um, I mean I. I want you to explain this. I actually think I know the answer, but I'm going to ask you to explain this. The service principal names that 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 these tickets are, are created under, um, you know, in my experience when pen testing, they're often domain administrative, right? Um, and that gives us an awful lot of power, right? If we crack them, um, that organization's in in big trouble. But do they have to be domain administrative? Oh, no, 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 not even a little bit. In fact, the one that I most commonly see domain administrator is for SQL Server. So if you look at the documents to set up a uh, um, Kerberos for SQL Server, it's a, you know, there's a lot of steps. Or the simple answer is make a domain administrator and it will configure everything for you. Hmm. So literally some of the documents online will say, just do it this way, it's easier, and then you can come back and change it. And of course, no that never does. happens, right? Yeah. No one ever changes it, right? And and that's the weakness, right? Because um, you know, I mean, as pen testers, you know, I, I want to hug Tim every time I see him because when when this came out, it was like, oh my god, this is a no privilege attack from the from the first uh, compromise point where we can actually crack what is in all likelihood a six character password or something ridiculously minimal and get us domain administrative privileges. <laughs> So, Tim, describe for our listeners how that attack works. Yeah, in fact, if you guys want to switch screens, yeah. I can do a brief little brief demo if you want. That'd be demo. awesome. Demo! Yay! Yay! And now, right. Tim, were you the, the discoverer of this attack, or was this? did you kind of piece together some previous research? Or did, while you're getting the demo set up, describe to me the, the process that you discovered this attack. Yeah, well, so I was – I forgot who I was talking to, but I was like, you know, there's got to be – we talk, we're talking about Kerberos for something. I'm like, wait a second, what is encrypting it? I'm like, well, there's only one shared secret, secret, so it has to be that that NTLM hash, right? So I'm like, well, let's let's go for that. Let, let's take a look at it. Let's dig into it. And then I had to read a bunch of RFCs, which were freaking brutal, mm -hmm. um, but ultimately ended up with some pretty cool stuff. I ended up writing my own cracker. Nice. Uh, no, 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 not so no, nice. Not, no, no, I did it in Python, and I was all happy with myself because I used the, uh, the 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 threading module. So I'm like, oh yeah, it's gonna go so much faster. And then uh, one of the guys at Black Hills, I forgot who it was. It was, it was probably Ethan, me. Or, <laughs> Ethan or Luke. It was probably one of the guys, Ethan or, or Ben or someone like that. Yeah. I think it was Ethan. Mm -hmm. Anyways, I showed, I showed it to him, and he's like, oh, cool. So he used it. And he's like, oh, you know what your optimal thread count is? Because you could set that in, in the options. I'm like, okay, is it number of processors, number of processors, plus one, minus one? He's like, uh, the optimal is one. My code was so inefficient that any using using the additional threads at all actually made it worse. And I, yeah. I, felt, I felt ashamed. Yeah, well, Python, <laughs> yeah. Python threading. It's is the not global really, interpreter lock. Yeah, uh, it's problem. not really. It's not oh, really yeah. multi-threading. Anyway, if you can yeah. make your, uh, you, can you, you know, make your text bigger, this... Tim? Yeah. Let me. In fact, let me. Um, let me get rid of transparency here. And, and by yeah, the way, there's this bigger, awesome class. This is awesome class you can take. It's called Sec 573, which I teach on a regular basis, <laughs> which is. <laughs> Uh, automating yeah, information security for Python. Uh, with, there you go. With Python. Yeah, you can learn about the limitations of Python threading. Uh, yeah. uh, py using Python and threading things. in the same sentence is blasphemy. To be honest. No, no, it's not, Paul. Come on now. Oh, it's come still multi-threading. It's, it's just multi-threading with a global interpreter. You know what it is? Lock. It's pseudo multi-threading, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is pseudo, but you can use multi-process as well, so it's not that bad. Pseudo multi-process. Oh, it's nearly the same. Me, it's, 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 it's like a, a pseudo. That's a pseudo cocktail. It's that's right. Yeah, it's like a pseudo cocktail. Yeah. It's like I mean, after I plugged it, I shit. Tim, this should be about Tim. <laughs> yeah. So nice. Tim, walk us through like, <laughs> okay, sure. what does it mean as an attacker that has no idea about Kerberos? Kerberos tickets are Microsoft, and and how they've implemented it. Like, uh, how does this attack work? Sure. So here, here we've got we've got an initial compromise on this system. Before you can do anything, you have to have you've got have to have one of two things: a compromised system, 
or uh, existing credentials. And I'll come back to the existing credential piece and how you can take advantage of that with some really cool work that the uh, the core security guys have done. Um, but right now, I've got a an, uh, a PowerShell Empire agent mm -hmm. on this win Windows 7 box. I also have a number of other servers. So here's my domain controller. I've got a, a SQL server here and then a, a web server right here. Now, let me go over to this, this uh, SQL server here, and I'm actually going to shut this guy down. Oops, make sure I shut the correct box down or else the demo goes to hell. All right, so I'm actually going to – no, do not want to do that. I do not want to update because that <laughs> – Update, that take yay. It, yeah. Don't update it. Shut down dash T now. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right, so this SQL server is offline. So I'm trying to like represent that, yes, we have a SQL server. Maybe it's inaccessible. Literally, it may have been decommissioned, but as long as we still have this SPN link mm -hmm. between this remote service and the underlying account, we can uh, extract this information. So the uh, the SPN, it can be mapped to the computer account. And as we mentioned before, that password, realistically, you're, you're not going to crack that in the time you have for any sort of reasonable pen test. Now, if people are going to pick a password, they're going to pick much, they're much more likely to pick a terrible password, uh, one that we're actually able to crack. And there's, uh, I, I actually wrote a, a PowerShell script, a VB script, and there's a number of other tools that do the same thing, but they look for those SPNs that are mapped to, uh, to user accounts and not to computer accounts. All right, SQL Server, why are you not dying? No, I told you not to. Here, we'll just do it the hard way. And just is it, it, it's off. applying updates whether you like it or not. Yeah, no kidding. I've had this on for 24 hours to make sure that this wouldn't happen. All right, yeah, we it's going it's gonna hate you now and and probably horribly crash. Right? <laughs> That's okay. Anyway. All right. So whatever. So that 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 is now gone. So let's take a look. We've got my my agents here. Let me interact with the uh, specific agent. Rename this. This is my Windows. Uh, uh, box. And, and so some of some of our listeners might know not know about PowerShell Empire. So could you uh, yeah, just do a, a brief yeah. thousand? Of, yeah. Oh sure. Yeah, absolutely. So I set up a, first. I set up a listener. This is going to receive uh, connections. This is sort of like the uh, the handler in Metasploit. Um, an agent is kind of like I mean, it's a connection to a remote system. So right now is what I, what I did initially is I just uh, pasted some PowerShell, and that PowerShell is going to connect back. And now I've got this connection back and forth, and that's my agent. It's running on this remote system, and it's going to check in every what does it say, five seconds or so. Gotcha. Um, so I, I, I'm going to task the agent. I'm going to ask it to get all of the uh, the, the uh, tickets for me. Now, it's really handy. Now, when I did this before, originally, I had to paste in, like, custom PowerShell or run a script. Um, it's integrated into these tools now, so it makes it significantly easier. Now, this – can I not kill this in any way, shape, or form? Is there, like, a nice trick to make this, like, absolutely die? Pop, look. Shotgun. Yeah. <laughs> well, you could always you could always kill the process, all of a sudden, right? It's like one of the reasons why I switched to Linux and Unix is because I had the kill command. I could always kill something. Yeah, but or how just, do you do that with with VMware and not kill the wrong thing? Or I could just type like halt. collateral damage would be bad. I can just type halt, and it always died, no matter what. <laughs> well, well, uh, Tim, if your VMware is running on uh, OS X, you can still kill it. You just have to find it. But yeah. I'm going to hit the wrong one. You know that's going to happen, right? Yeah, you know that's going to happen. <laughs> so <laughs> user beware, right? <laughs> oh, man. All right. So regardless, we'll let, we'll let that run. It's, it's, it's not going to be communicating on the network. It's not going to allow incoming connections at this point because it is shutting down. So if you try to connect to the, the remote SQL service, uh, it is, in fact, offline at this point. Um, at this point, I can say use module. There's a whole bunch of modules. I'm just going to hit the tab tab here for the tab completion. And we can see piles and piles of uh, these various modules that we have uh, to use. And it's actually going to run it on the remote agent. So it'll task the agent uh, when it checks back in to run some of these various uh, modules. And this so is through I, PowerShell Empire? This is through PowerShell Empire. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. So I'm just going to say use module. Now, I wrote the original tool. I did not have anything to do with PowerShell Empire. PowerShell Empire is awesome. It, is, mm. it automates a lot of the PowerShell tools and commands that we have available everywhere else. So they've taken this, they've optimized it, and added all this capability into mm -hmm. uh, into PowerShell Empire. So they took your work and extended it into PowerShell oh, Empire. Oh, yeah. Okay. They did it awesome, yeah. And like, who, I, who are the folks behind PowerShell Empire? We've had most of them on the show. 
It's the um, well, they're all at Specter Ops now. It's yes. Like, it's like Will Schroeder, yep. and I feel terrible for not rem- remembering their, all of their names off the top of my head. Harm Joy. Harm Joy. Schroeder. Yeah, we've had some of them on the show, and the ones that haven't, the ones that haven't, we're reaching out to them to bring them on the show. So awesome. Yeah, they're they're super nice guys. They're awesome guys. Anyway, so they they took this, they automated it. So the original method, I had to use. Uh, Mimic cats to extract these tokens from from RAM, mm-hmm. and then s- somebody else figured out that you could just quickly grab it from a PowerShell, which is awesome. exactly what they're doing here. So what it's gonna what it's doing is it's automating the hunting for those SPNs, mm-hmm. and then it's going to actually extract those so I can run th- use this module. Now because I'm already in the agent for this Windows Seven box, it's going to run it on this specific agent, and I could actually task this to run on multiple agents, but I only have the one, so. Um, so we've got the module. We can look, take a look at my. Uh, oh, that doesn't look work well with the big screen. Um, agent is good. Output format is John. Fantastic. And then we can just simply say, if I can type. Oops. Now, now the the John output is a John the Ripper uh, compatible output, <laughs> correct? Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So what it's going to do is it's going to get those tickets and then it's going to get this. Now, I, oh my gosh. One of the things that I really wanted to do when I did my talk years ago is I really wanted to have the John the Ripper module. Have you ever looked at the code for John the Ripper? I haven't. Oh my God. It's I, 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 I've, I've looked at it. <laughs> I'm not smart enough. There's like, they do, and it's, to be fair, it's, it's, there's a lot of optimizations because speed is so key, but I had no clue. I, I was absolutely just dumbfounded. Like, I felt really, really dumb. Founded. All right. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, go ahead. All right, so here are our our two tickets. So I only have, in my mini domain, I only have uh, these couple of servers. I've got the web server and then the uh, the SQL server here. So here are the tickets for uh, each of these. Now, I can copy those. And those are the specific service tickets, right? Like I got my ticket granting ticket, and those are the tickets that are specific to those services. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So there's that mapping between. So let's let's watch back, take a step back. So if, if I want, I was legitimate user, and I wanted to connect to the SQL server, mm-hmm. I, I would hit hit that box, and that box is going to say, you know what, hey, you got to talk to me through uh, the Kerber host. So I'll go to the domain controller and say, "Hey, I need a, uh, I need to talk to this. Here's my here's my ticket granting ticket. Mm-hmm. Now I don't know the underlying account, but used by that box. But Active Directory has that mapping. It says, "Oh, you're on uh, Web 01 or you're on SQL 05, whatever. That SQL service is mapped to this other account." It will then take ver- verify me, and then it's going to give me a ticket back. Remember, there's those two halves. Half I right. can decrypt, and then half the remote service can, can can decrypt. And it's going to decrypt its portion with its NTLM hash, and it's going to decrypt my portion with my NTLM hash. So I'll get my piece back. The server gets its piece back. Or sorry, the, I get the full ticket back, and then when I try to connect to that server, I'll pass the ticket along with it. Right, the ticket the, you can't do, the portion of the ticket you can't decrypt, you'll send to the server. Right, absolutely, yeah. yep. So I'll send it to the server, and ideally, in, in you know, best case, the server's the only one who can decrypt the ticket. Right. And then we have our, uh, th- then the server will decide, hey, are you good or are you bad? Mm-hmm. Can you talk? That's not a decision made the domain controller, because that's just, that'd be overwhelming for I the gotcha. domain controller. Yeah, yeah, makes right. sense. Um, so we're just going to grab that ticket, and then we'll pull it back and crack it. Now, I tried this before, and I've got four VMs running and a couple other things open at the same time. And when I tried to use Hashcat at the exact same time, I core dumped. So <laughs> no what's, supposed, what's supposed to happen here? I'll just pull it up. So, But so, you're, Tim, you're going to try and decrypt the portion that's sent to the server that only the server is supposed to be able to decrypt, correct? Correct. So what we have here, this is this is the portion that's extracted from RAM per portion. So this is the this is this is the ticket the server would get and decrypt using the underlying password associated with account mm-hmm. that's uh, that's mapped here. Um, and then this one, same thing with the SQL server. So the SQL server here's here's the actual SPN. So you can see MS SQL service. Yep. And then here's the server SQL zero one, and then you can have the the, the port. And then here's the encrypted portion of the ticket mm-hmm. and, and again this is 
associated with this remote account. So I can decrypt, or sorry, try to crack this and then get the, uh, the password, and then I can start to use that, that credential anywhere I want to in the environment. So let's see. Well, so that would, that would give you access to that service regardless of whether or not your ticket had access to it or not. Well, so there's there's two pieces. So once I the, the simple answer is once I have this credential, I can I can start authenticating to other systems as that remote service. So that oh. service account, let's say, let's say that this is mapped to the back end. In fact, I, I know it's mapped to a back end service called um, SQL Engine. Mm -hmm. So if I crack this, you know, I, I think the password is like password zero one because it's supposed to crack quickly. Mm -hmm. But if I, if I crack this, I can now look up what the this SPN maps to, get that account name. I've cracked the password, and now I can start start cracking, start start connecting with those credentials all over the domain. I see. And those credentials are valid throughout the domain because the SQL Server needs access to other stuff, or it's just a domain account ultimately. I got gotcha. you. Okay. So let me see if I can. Let me look, let me pull up some PowerShell here. Whoop. Helps if I click right. So you can actually list the mapping, sit SPN dash T, just named after myself. So the T tells it the forest and then the, uh, the query is what I want to query. So for example here, here's my SQL engine. Mm -hmm. So if I'm looking, here's the SPN, so that Microsoft SQL Service on SQL 01 on this port. Here's the underlying account. So this is the SQL Engine account. Yep. is actually mapped to this remote service and port. So that's how I can get the underlying, that's how I can get the account name. And of course, Active Directory needs that because if I want to connect to this remote mm -hmm. service, it needs to figure out the hash that's associated with it so we can use that hash to then encrypt, then encrypt the, uh, the ticket that's, des that's designed for this remote service. And that, that tells you what other services that my SQL service, that SQL service rather has in, in other places in the domain? Yeah, so this is, this this SQL engine account is mapped to these two. Mm -hmm. Now this is basically the same thing. It's just this one has the port and this one doesn't. Um, we we'll see other ones, and we'll see in this case. You'll notice that the the, the the canonical name here, it's in the the users group. So we know this is a user account. There's other ways, uh, lower level, where we can figure out how the account was actually created. Mm -hmm. But for example, here we can also see like here's a computer account. There's no way I'm going to be able to crack that because this is the one that's generated by Active Directory. It, it rotates and all that jazz. Whereas this user account, it has the potential of being something that someone has chosen poorly, mm -hmm. and now we can crack that password. Mm -hmm. All right. So let me flip. What, another really cool thing you could do. I did set up. Well, actually, let's let's see if I can type this real quick. I'm sorry. Tim, the... So, once you crack this password, what what does that get you as an attacker? So, at this point, once I crack this password for the SQL engine, mm -hmm. I can now authenticate. I can use that SQL engine account to authenticate to any system on the domain. It's just like a regular other user account. Hmm. So, I and, and as we mentioned before, what we'll commonly see is the SQL Server account is SA. In fact, I shouldn't say commonly. It's the most common one that I've seen. Um, because it's so much easier to set up. It, it, you need a, some special privileges to, to register the SPN, and people get lazy, so they just make it a domain administrator. Um, and then oh, we, I see. So the, by cracking that SQL Server account, it gives you higher privileges in the domain. Yep, yep, absolutely. I gotcha. And then there's, uh, a, there's in, a, in, 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 I, I've seen, just to, just to chime in on that, just in existing pen tests, I've seen two scenarios. One is... Um, by cracking it, it gives you high privileges on an individual box, mm -hmm. and the other one is it gives you domain administrative privilege. Either way, it's a bonus because if you get high privilege on an individual box, you can pivot to that box and then dump credentials using something like Mimikatz I gotcha. probably get a domain administrative credential. I gotcha. So it's a privilege escalation attack at the end of the day. Absolutely. Yeah, so here is the... Um... So here's my, my, my crappy Python cracker with my very uh, short list. 
Um, so we, I, I have those service, those tickets on this box, and I use my again in the real world. Please, dear God, do not use this Python script. It is so bloody slow and poorly written. I apologize. <laughs> I apologize to humanity for writing this crap. Mm -hmm. But whatever. So for this demo, I have these tickets, and we use the passwords in my, my my word list here, and we've cracked the tickets, and we can see that the tick the um, password one. Is the, is the password associated with the web zero one and then SQL zero one, it is uh, Phoenix. And so why got, is it why is it so easy to crack the the password for this this particular ticket, Tim? Well, in this case, it's because they picked a terrible password. And, and typically, people do because they think it's just a service account and they don't they don't think of the repercussions. Well, I. I, mean, I don't know the underlying reason they did it, but I think a lot of the reason is, especially for something like SQL, is someone set that thing 15 years ago, mm -hmm. and everyone is terrified of it, right? We all have those servers where you don't you walk into the server room and you don't make direct eye contact with them right. because if you right. do, they'll crash. <laughs> yeah. and, and once a year, you bring in a bowl of fruit as a sacrifice, and you bow and you walk out. You don't turn your back on it because if you turn your back on it, you pissed it off. It's going to crash, right? Right. Um, no, so you know you're, that's you're, like you're both you're, you're both right, um, by the way, because I've seen plenty of environments where this has worked, and the password is like six characters, and Tim's exactly right. It is it goes back like how dare I change this because the service is going to break and and ho holy hell is going to break loose, right? Yeah. Um. So yeah. Richard, do you have questions or comments at this point? I, I like it kind of a interesting take on this whole this whole problem as most of us have backgrounds in penetration testing and attacking active directory and, and doing that stuff but from a, a crypto background i'm curious as to your take on it i don't know it's just sort of the opposite end of the scale isn't it you go from things that have got four thousand bits down to things that have got six characters yeah yeah you know and it's no matter how you train people like you say it's just that fear of just screwing something up mm -hmm. you know yeah. and the, the the pain of failure is so great <laughs> yeah yeah that you take the risk right it's astonishing I don't think that the people that install the services, and, and Tim alluded to this, they don't realize the potential impact. And, and, and what, what Tim did with his research is he you know, connected that to real impact, I mean, significant impact, um, where you know, for years, just like, just like Tim was saying, everybody was ignoring it like, oh, well, this, has no, you know, this is not realistic. It's just a software service. What's the big deal, right? Well, I think it gets into that a little bit of that field where people are just – someone says the word crypto and people freak out. They're like, crypto, yep, it's impossible. Like exactly what we were talking about during break. No, you didn't break crypto because it's impossible. And people just kind of wave it off. And there's some sort of magic crypto pixie dust surrounding this that are like, yeah, we're good. Don't want to look into it. It's too hard. We're totally good, right? Mm. And people don't understand escalation. They, they don't have enough of a bigger view of the whole system to understand mm. where this stuff ripples to. They think about – Gee, does this create? You know, does, can I can I create a fake service? Okay, that's in their domain. That's something to think about. But yeah. How can I use this to ripple through the system? People don't have that scale of view norm normally. Mm. Well, the, 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 the kind of the, another sort of fun thing that I did a little bit of research into, but I haven't spent too much time with it. Um, I talked about it at the end of my talk at DerbyCon. So that ticket that is sent to the remote service. When it's decrypted by the remote service, it contains information about you. I'm going to pull up the slide here real quick from the, the talk. But it, it includes what's called the PAC, the Privilege uh, Attribute Certificate. So this is information about the user that's trying to authenticate. And that's how the remote service decides, yes, you have access, or, or no, you should not have access. Um, and it's signed. It's signed. Guess what it uses to sign it? That same NTLM hash. So the server can verify that it wasn't tampered. But it's using the same hash that we already have, right? Hmm. Uh, so we can actually rewrite that. There's actually a second signature um, that is signed with the uh, KRBTGT. But with the, the problem is, if that server validates it, it, it has to send it to the domain controller. The domain controller validates it, and then it has to send it back. So it, it makes things a little bit slower. And things like SQL Server, you can't have that extra latency, right? If I want queries, I need that response fast. So it's not going to do the additional validation, which is another benefit with uh, SQL Server, which which means because this is encrypted with the, the server's hash, it's signed with the server's hash, 
and it doesn't the the hash is not va validated against the uh, the domain. It means we can actually rewrite the uh, the, the certificate or sorry the, the pack, and we can actually lie to the remote service. And I can say, oh yeah, by the way, I'm actually somebody else. Interesting. Hmm. So like we can do something like let me see this demo. So for here's for example, I've got the C the SQL engine. And I'm logged in as just a regular lowly level user, and I should have. Oh shit! Now that service is offline, right? The one that okay. I just. Yeah, yeah, I'm down. Yeah. <laughs> so are you, are you issuing awesome. fake certificates, or are you breaking the verification cycle for legitimate certificates? So it's a. I mean, it's defined legitimate, right? So if I sign, if the signature matches and it's encrypted properly, the remote services think thinks, oh yeah, you're you're, you're totally cool, right? So. What I'm doing is just re-signing, creating a new certificate. Or in this case, we can create a new one or modify an existing one, and we can add information to it. So let me launch this. Because you, got the, because you figured the key out. Correct. Absolutely. Okay. Mm. Yep. So this gets us back to the rocker stuff we were talking about before. It's exactly the same thing. If you can grab that mm -hmm. private key, then you can fake a code signing signature. Can, right. Exactly. Which means you can push yes. whatever you like out as they just about code. Same deal. And as it's applied to Kerberos, it makes my head spin because Kerberos has a different. <laughs> well, that's I, mean, a good, I don't know how much time you spent with Kerberos, but it makes my head my head spin with the whole, the whole but, process. But the fundamentals are all the same. They are. Is, they are. Yeah. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's all PKI, pretty much. Different era, though. Yeah, like a we. It's like a weird. Uh, yeah, the whole. Tim's analogy of the ticket granting ticket is very sound right like that's my my pass into the amusement park mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. <laughs> actually um that's a fantastic analogy because that's that's Kerberos is actually sort of difficult to understand and that is i think one of the best analogies i've ever heard me too uh to to explain it um mm -hmm. so well done tim well i've explained it enough times where i've tried to break it down as simple as possible to think you know, when you do it a thousand times, it, it, it gets a little easier. But once you've got, you, you you got that kit, you've basically got a ticket printing machine. Exactly, mm. exactly. And, right. and I, can put, I can put the stamp on there that says it's legitimate. Mm -hmm. right. It's like, oh, let's, let's check and make sure it's good. Well, it's like, okay, it's well, like well, you're I standing have... by that ride saying, hey, 10 cents, I'll give you a ticket to the ride. I'll give you a ticket to the ride. Right. Yep, exactly, exactly. All right, SQL Server, come online. Let me kill the other uh, I do not need the web server. Now, the, so the interesting thing about the web server, so the SQL server um, by default, and you can change it, but no one ever does because of performance. Um, so there's additional setting that if if the service is uh, marked to run as part of the operating system, it won't verify that extra signature on the pack. Hmm. Um, but like a web server, it will because there's some abstraction because of app pools and such. So while I can use this... Um, with password one with the web zero one, whatever that maps back to, I can use that to log into other systems. Um, what I can't do is I can't rewrite tickets because if I rewrite tickets for this, it will validate against the domain controller and say, nope, you're not, you're not, you're not cool. Whereas the SQL server, because of the, you know, efficiencies and we want speed and performance, um, it will not be verified. Now, of course you can change it, but realistically, no one's going to want to do to uh, degrade performance. Hmm. Um, so that we can do our rewrite. And the cool thing is when you rewrite the ticket and you completely just nuke the ticket, you don't have to put valid information in and you don't have to, you don't have to follow the RFCs. So, um, for example, so like the username, the username, you know, there's, there's format requirements with the username, but when I rewrite that ticket, I can rewrite anything I want to. So I can change the uh, like the ID to a number that doesn't exist. So when it looks up the RID in Active Directory to say, hey, who logged in? Account 999999 doesn't exist. Okay, whatever. Or my account name is script alert one, and that shows up in the log. So that's, of course, not going to be a, a valid name, right? Hmm. The SQL server is going super fast. It's got more updates. I don't even know how it has updates. I swear I turned that off. Killing me, Smalls. Oh. Let me shut this guy down here for reals. Oh, lovely. Well, if you want, I mean, I'll, I'll, if you got any other questions while we're uh, running yeah. through this, or, or we can move on to something else too while this is. Or yeah, just if, talk it. Talk just through, basically Tim. skip it. Yeah. So um, the uh, here's sort of the example of that pack we were talking about a second ago. 
So there is the, there's the two pieces. And the one, like I mentioned, that is signed using the hash that we already have. I, I kind of don't, I mean, I sort of get the, the reason for it so that they have something to verify against, but you know, what's the point, right? If you've already, if it's decrypted successfully with that key, why would it not check out with the, uh, the, the, the signature, right? But whatever. And then there's the, the second one that's actually signed with K when the ticket is generated on the domain controller, it's going to sign it. Um, and only the domain controller has that key. So when it passes the ticket back to the domain controller to validate, it can check this and make sure everything is okay. And it'll tell the remote service, yep, ticket is okay, proceed, or uh, the ticket is bad, drop the connection. All right, come on, it's at 70, lovely. Killing me, Windows. One of the cool things, oh, so it was funny. So I, I like I said, I was shopping this talk around for 18 months, mm. and I, 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 I couldn't get anybody to pick it up. And then, like, it's DerbyCon weekend. I'm getting ready to give that talk. So I'm going to all of the talks the day before. I'm like, dear God, please nobody release anything. Please don't don't release this. Like, I want to it, – it's just one more day, right? I need 24 hours. Please don't – nobody step on my thunder. And I go to the last talk. It's by ObscureSec, and he talks about Kerberos. And I'm like, oh, God, please, please no, please no. And I end up like, – everything's cool. He doesn't talk about it. So I go out and I'm like, okay, we're going drinking tonight. I'm super excited. I literally wake up the next morning and Delpy has done some of this exact same work. I'm like, son of a bitch. I'm like, oh, no. You're, you're, Fr you're French, dude. Like, you're not supposed to work on Saturdays. <laughs> yeah. So, like, here's the, here's the actual screenshot. So, it, this is at 9.06 a.m., the morning of, of DerbyCon. And Delpy's like, hey, it looks like some of the servers don't validate the pack, so I can create these tickets and rewrite them. And I was like, well, shit. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, dude. So I, I'm, 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 and he's a super nice guy. So I'm, I'm tweeting back and forth with him. Very friendly guy. And I'm like, dude, I needed like six hours. He's like, oh, right. you want to pull, it, you want to pull it down? Like, no, 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 no. That's it's cool. So we went back and forth, and uh, I, I was giving him feedback, and he was giving me feedback. He actually, he actually gave me this made, this made, this made my day. He gave me a custom version of uh, Mimikatz mm -hmm. with my name in it. Oh, that's awesome. I know, right? Oh, it's fantastic. Oh, is he the developer of Mimikatz? Is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's him. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. I got you. No, I this, is the, this is the Tim, the Tim McGee gave... version. I know, right? I was. It made, it made my day. I was so happy. All right, cool. SQL Server booted. So here is our login failed. Okay, so this TM account does not have access to the SQL Server. All right, so let's let's since we have the credential now, we can rewrite the ticket. So I need to first purge all of the, the tickets that I have. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite, the, rewrite this, this, uh, this ticket. Copy this, paste it here. And this is essentially because you brute forced the password of that initial ticket. Correct. Yep. Oops. That's not going to work. Mimic. All right. So what I've done is we've given it the credential. Uh, for the remote that 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 Phoenix was a Phoenix one, um, told the remote service, Microsoft SQL service, the system, blah blah blah, and now it's generated a, a new ticket. And what we've added is group uh, five thirteen. If I remember correctly, five thirteen is domain administrator. Mm -hmm. So now if you go back to the the SQL server, let this tool launch, and we authenticate. What it should happen is it should allow us back in. So we'll connect, and now we have access to the SQL Server because I, I simply rewrote it. And I, at this point, though, I'm still authenticating as myself. Now, this is always going to show this information because this is the client loading it locally. What I could do is I can actually ask the SQL Server who it thinks I am so I can get, like, these two queries. So let me copy that, switch back, paste this, and we'll execute. So it sees I'm Tim, and then here's my my uh, RID. And we do the math on it. That does actually math back properly. So let me close this again. I don't want to save anything. Just go away. Let's purge the ticket again.
And don't forget to help make Microsoft SQL better. <laughs> Absolutely. Sorry. Right. I saw the pop up. I saw the pop up. <laughs> All right. So I created a, a, a new ticket. And you'll notice here that I just added all of the fun groups. So it's like domain administrator, enterprise administrator, schema administ admin. Um, I changed the user ID to 998, which is actually a, an account that doesn't exist in my domain. That's the, the, that's the, the RID. With this connect, it's cool. I can do my new query. Go back, I'll paste these two. And now my username is actually select star from pwned. <laughs> nice. So explain what you just did, Tim, to our audience. Yeah, so what we did is because the ticket is encrypted and signed with the hash of the remote service, I have total control of this because I have that hash. So I've regenerated a ticket using a username of my choice, in this case, select star from pwned, with the user ID 998. What I could just as easily do, let me go back here, we'll... Uh, Purge my tickets again. Um, I could paste this. Whoops, I don't want to do that one. And I could paste any other ticket. Like one of my other favorite ones is uh, this. So let me relaunch this real quick. So be I, I, again, regenerate a ticket because I have the NTLM hash, and the mm -hmm. NTLM hash is used for signing and the encryption. So I can then generate my own ticket. So I can get on any ride, and I can pretend to be anybody I want to. And so you can provide tickets to anybody else you want to give rides to, is the point, Right. Isn't it? So in this case, this user ID I changed to 999. This is not a valid account with, with uh, inside the environment. So let me connect in. We'll do another query. But it, but it doesn't matter that it's not a valid account, right? Because Kerberos, it just trusts that that, that ticket's right. Right, exactly. So it doesn't ver because it's SQL, it's not going to verify against the, uh, the domain. So it's like, oh, yeah, whatever you passed me, it's cool because the domain controller signed it. Said it, it was cool. It. Yeah, yeah. yeah so it, it totally said it cool. So what's funny too is, so if you look at the logs for this, this SQL server here, oops, I had to get the wrong button. Um, it'll actually say in the logs, it was authenticated to, unable to, they hit the wrong button. Like in this example, you were authenticated by your mom. So in the logs, it will say <laughs> your mom all over the place. And like I, like I would love to see the look on someone's face like when they get an incident response report and be like, so what account was compromised? Like, well, it was... It was your it mom. Was, it was your mom. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's fabulous. <laughs> and if you actually take this number and you convert it from uh, the hex back to um, decimal in the SID format, you'll actually see that the last, the RID, the last piece of this, the SID... Um, it will end up being 999, which is also invalid. Nine, nine, nine. Yeah. So it's sure. like, yeah, so your mom hacked us and we have zero, zero way to trace this account back. So like, to, to just kind of summarize here, again, let's, let's walk back through the entire scenario. So that we have our, our first account compromise. Um, and so this is my Windows box. We have this account compromise. And we're just using just a regular low-level user. This account TM is a nobody. So uh, a net user tm slash domain it's just a regular old domain user and any user can can uh, ask for this information on the, on the mm -hmm. domain um, this this technique our powershell empire technique is using this existing credential to connect there's another tool of uh, impact um, impact it from the core security guys where it does not require um this this kind of a connection you can actually do this from like a, a cali box or some sort of non-windows system really so you don't have to be part of the domain to get that right you right. just have to be able to talk to mm. yeah just, that, that's oh, actually interesting you mentioned that tim because hmm. um i've often uh used the impact tool and actually just proxied uh through an existing box that i have ownership on and just you know pull the tickets and had fun right so yeah exactly. it's very cool so there's, there's, there's the two approaches. And then once we have that level of access, we can now um, extract those tickets, pull them offline for cracking, and it's in mass. 
So I get huge quantities of tickets, and all I need realistically is is one, right? Um, and oftentimes, or more often than it should, one of those is going to be a domain administrator. Then I can start using that domain administrator, like literally just, it's sort of like a, a cut in line, right? Once you once you get one account, you request tickets, you crack, and now you can jump the domain administrator. It almost feels like cheating. And then you can start pillaging like like crazy. So you don't need to be on a computer that's part of the domain to request tickets. Correct. Using a tool like Impact, you do have to have a valid credentials of some kind. I got gotcha. you. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. The- what? What? Uh, sorry, Tim. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I'm going to grab some more beer. Go ahead, Jeff. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Well, I'll just uh, explain the scenario that I. Um, you can have a, a position on the inside and have something like a C2 channel out. And uh, the last one I did, I had like a interpreter channel out to my uh, Linux box on the internet. And then I proxied the traffic for the uh, Kerberos transactions so that I could actually request tickets from the Linux box through. Um, that internal system. So, you know, I was just proxying the traffic. I could still request the tickets legitimately and pull them down and do whatever I wanted to do with them, which, you know, is the point, right? You wanted to grab those tickets to be able to crack the hashes. So, yeah, you don't actually have to be uh, part of the domain per se, but you need to be proxying through a box that has a legitimate account in that domain, though. Yeah, this is not your initial initial compromise. This is right. yeah, you've gained right a after hole. your first yeah, and that's what oftentimes people yeah, it, say. It, it's, it's literally the second step. Once they get that first account, they jump to something like this, and just let it crack back in the background. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a it's a post exploitation step, um, without a doubt, right? And but but we often do tests, uh, certainly at Black Hills, where we we ask the customer to put us on the inside, so the 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 sort of phishing exercise is irrelevant. We're already there, um, and so uh, Kerberos thing becomes, you know, like a no-brainer at that point. Um, you should just do it and, uh, and so, see what happens. Yeah, this uh, attack is uh, lovingly called Kerberos thing and really relies on the fact that someone has created a service account that's in the domain administrator's account or some higher level of privilege, correct? Uh, well, no, because you can still get a lot of leverage just out of a regular user account, mm-hmm. or a lower privileged account, rather. Um, the key here is the, the crappy password. And the, the simple fix is pick a good password. The better fix is to uh, to, to use the, uh, I forget the exact, you remember the name, Joff, for that, the, the, the Microsoft setup that will automatically rotate yeah. the password? It's a LAPS? Is yeah, that LAPS? It's the LADS. LADS. Yeah. It's LADS. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, LAPS. Um, so uh, local administrator. Oh, yeah, LAPS. Uh, I'm sorry. Privilege. Yeah, LAPS. Something, I forget what it's called, but yeah, okay. So yeah. how does LAP, been, how does LAPS play into this whole thing? I thought well, that was let, a unique let, password let me, uh, for all your local administrators. Exactly. Let, let, let me kind of chime in on that with with hmm. some pen testing experience, and I'll let Tim comment as well. Um, it is often the case uh, with Kerberosting that I have found um, a password to an account that is not domain administrative but is a domain account that is locally administrative mm-hmm. on the yeah. SQL server or whatever entity um, that, that we've cracked. So the, the next step then is to pivot to that system using that locally administrative account uh, and then use something like Mimikatz to extract passwords um, to then you know hopefully get a domain administrative account. Now, normally something like a SQL server is kind of a high visibility, high privilege entity in the environment so it's very, very likely that that pivot attempt will result in another domain and privileged account being exposed just by fact, by virtue of the fact that I get a locally administrative account. So LAPS plays into this in that um, the locally privileged accounts get managed by LAPS and, and the credentials get rotated right. such that that won't potentially happen. Does that make mm. sense? Yep. Yep. Tim, well, any then, thoughts? Yeah, no, no, absolutely. That is that – is, Exactly characterizes it. What I've also seen, though, too, is when people have set up the, uh, the the SQL the SQL account, so it's not a SQL administrator, and it registers with uh, um, Active Directory to set the SPN, yada yada yada. Uh, but you have a SQL account. That's where all the data is, right inside the SQL server. So you can use that account and th- th- to then access that data. 
because you don't need the necessarily domain administrator if you can just go straight to the data because that's ultimately what the bad guys are mm -hmm. after, right? They don't care about DA only in so far as it helps them get to the data that makes them money because they have, you know, they have kids to feed. They like Bentleys too, right? <laughs> You know, that, that's actually a really good point, e even from the pen testing perspective. Um, you know, our objective is to demonstrate risk. Demonstrating risk doesn't mean domain administration, yep. right? De demonstrating risk means showing access to business critical data. Uh, and, you know, SQL server access absolutely can potentially show access to business critical data. So, you know, that's um, that's extremely relevant. And not only that, there are usually more credentials contained within that SQL Server instance as well. Tim, where can people go to learn more about this attack? I know you've published several several uh, slide decks. Um, where can people go to find those? Honestly, there's a I, I, the the latest and greatest. Re, uh, Blogs and stuff are, are are not mine. I did the initial stuff, but so many people have picked up the just think the way better work with it. Um, so if you simply goober, go, go, if you goober, if you Google for a uh, Kerberos team, um, like uh, Derek Banks at Black Hills, he mm -hmm. has a he has a fantastic blog post. M Mubix has a, a three part series that's fantastic. One of my favorites is the there's uh, adsecurity.com. They yeah. have um, how you can detect this attack. Um, essentially, the short answer is just look for people requesting a bunch of tickets with s certain characteristics. Um, and then, of course, the PowerShell Empire guys have done a bunch of uh, research and blog posting uh, related to this. So just, you know, simple Google search. Frankly, it's, it's not even my work because they did a better job. So go look at They've their stuff. It. Well, Tim, uh, yeah. I just want to thank you for your uh, research. Uh, you've been a friend for a long time, and I, I was so glad to see that you were uh, a, a big part of this research in a, a huge way, especially in the beginning, and and so humble to say, hey, look, others have taken my research and taken it to all kinds of new heights. So uh, I think it's kind of a, a, a definitely a learning moment for people in our community to say, look, go research something, and if people extend it, that's cool. That's okay. That's awesome. And and you've been awesome about that. So, Oh, thank you. Yeah, there's, you know, I can't say that I haven't stepped on the shoulders of a lot of giants and, I mean, frankly, learned a bunch from you guys and the, the, the people that have been in your podcast. So, you know, share, share, like. And now, what are you doing today, Tim? You have a, a consulting company? I do. I do. Yeah, I started my own consulting company, uh, Red Siege, where we focus on uh, offensive uh, pen testing, red teaming, uh, web pen testing, all sorts of uh, fun offensive type stuff. I got, even have cool stickers. Check this out. Yeah, you are. nice, very nice. <laughs> I love it. I am offensive, is what that says for our audience. Yeah. Please send yeah. a stack to the studio. Yeah, please yeah, do. Oh, absolutely. Give me, give me addresses. Anybody, somebody, hit me up on. If you hit me up on Twitter with an address, I'll send you a piles of them. It's uh, at Tim Medine. Good luck spelling that. It's T I M M E D I N. But I'd be happy to send these things out. I think they're hilarious. Awesome. I was so excited. Oh, I I, I've got to have one of those, Tim. <laughs> well, uh, Tim, thank you so much. I'm, I'm so glad you were able to uh, to come on and explain all of uh, the Kerber roasting uh, attacks. Uh, we've never aired that uh, segment on our show before. And, and who better than the like original founder of these attacks, which has <laughs> found its way into lots of other tools and, and other people's techniques. So uh, thank you for that. Cool. Thank you guys so much for having me. I always have a, a great time here, guys. Awesome. Thanks so much, Tim. With that, we're going to take a short break. We're going to come back. We're going to round out the show with a pre-recorded uh, interview with Gotti Evron from Symmetria that's going to give a new take on hacking back, which is a lot of fun, and that's how we'll round out the show. So stay tuned. <laughs> 